Welcome to Impactology Live. It is with great pleasure that we welcome everyone to our next guest, and in particular, a big hello to the beautiful people in Houston. Um, today's um, a wonderful day for us, Rita. We've got some amazing speakers from all around the place. We do. And uh, we kicked off this morning with uh, Ruler Christie from Houston. And in the next episode of the Houston Chronicles, uh, we've actually got uh, Tassos Katsawunas. Uh, Tassos um, is joining us, and, um, and it's a personal connection again for me, uh, Rita. Uh, Tassos is married to Ruler. Uh, we've never met, but Tassos' story from 18,000 miles away has made an impact on me. Uh, and we just wanted to share his story today. Um, so Tassos, welcome to Impactology Live. Thank you. And George, it's, it's finally nice to meet you, even though it is virtually. Absolutely. What we'll do is for the benefit of um, everyone that's joining us from Melbourne, I'm just going to give a bit of background in terms of uh, your story uh, before we get you uh, chatting about uh, what you're up to and, and where you've been. Sure. So, so Tassos was born and raised in Dallas, <coughs> Texas, where his family owned a bar and grill. Whilst helping out in the family business, Tassos spent 22 years in business consulting and having spent over a decade in business consulting, I know how hard that is, until he made the decision to take the road less travelled. Tassos is, a part, is part of a growing breed of entrepreneurs applying years of experience, maturity and intuition to forge a new path and follow his passion and we're going to get into that shortly. What's unique about Tassos is that he's moved away from applying his skills in a familiar setting to doing something completely different and that's the part of the story for me that uh, really piqued my interest and I wanted to find out more about it. In Tassos's case, he's built the Breadman Baking Company into an independent commercial bakery based in Houston. Today, Breadman Baking Company has partnered with some of the country's top chefs, hotels and grocery retailers. As I said, I've admired the story from afar. So again, Tassos, welcome. We've got so much uh, distance to cover in a short space of time. Can you share with us your experiences growing up in Dallas and what influenced you growing up? Sure. So um, I'm, I'm the oldest in a Greek immigrant family. So as George may know or may not know, uh, everything kind of falls on your shoulders as the oldest. So <clears throat> I was very attached um, to my mother at a young age in the kitchen particularly. So my mother at a young age um, would bake bread out of our home um, out of necessity. Um, when my parents moved here to the States, they had $100 between the two of them and a suitcase. And so it was very, uh, it was difficult for them to purchase the very good bread that they had uh, access to back in Greece and the villages in Greece. And so my mother started baking bread um, regularly for us. And I, of course, jumped in because I wanted to learn anything that my mom was doing, including cooking. So I picked it up and I ran with it. And we used to do it kind of on a weekly basis. And it was a bonding moment for us. But growing up in Dallas was interesting. Uh, English was not my first language uh, because my spare, my parents didn't speak any English. So naturally, I spoke, you know, our, uh, the native language of Greek. And um, it, it was, I, I, I love Dallas. Obviously, it's home. It's where my parents still live. Um, but, you know, my parents' work ethic, um, being that they were immigrants, um, is really had a big influence on me. Um, I don't know how to sit still. And my wife will probably tell you that I work too much. Um, but I don't think it that way because it's just who I am and what I know how to do. If I have the passion and the belief in something, to me, it's not work. It's something I look forward to doing even after the kids go to bed at night. Um, so my parents, watching my parents, so before they opened the bar and grill that you mentioned in the introduction, George, my, my mother was a maid and cleaned houses around the Dallas area. Uh, and my father was an electrician. And so you can imagine they worked extensive hours. Uh, my father would work 14, 16 hour days very regularly. And, and my, you know, my mother would clean two or three houses a day. 
So knowing that they were putting in that effort and the reason behind it, which was to provide, you know, my brother and I um, a life that they wanted to give us by immigrating to the States, that really motivated me, right? To know that whatever I was going to do professionally when I grew up, I knew I needed to put 110% of myself into it and commit to it. And outside of family and, and that story of, you know, migrant parents going to a foreign country, obviously Rita and I in the same situation here, Rita's parents from Italy and obviously, um, as you know, mine from Greece. Um, you know, a lot of the, it's less about what they say and what they do that we learn from. So uh, outside of those family influences, who was an inspiration for you growing up? Where did you draw, you know, your um, yeah, inspiration and who were your heroes? Yeah, that's a great story. So, or a great interest, interesting question, I should say. Um, I I had a, an interesting childhood growing up. Um, I was an athlete, um, played uh, American football from the fourth grade in elementary school all the way through high school. Um, potentially could have played uh, college, but had some injuries that that um, that prevented that from happening. However. Um, you know, being in athletics um, and being in a team situation taught you quite a bit as a young, impressionable teen, right, in the high school and into uh, junior high for that matter or middle school. Um, <clears throat> so I had a lot of positive influences from my teammates and some of my coaches. Um, I had a lot of teachers that really wanted to support me because um, I was a very quiet and shy kid. I was not talkative like I am now. Um, I to this day, you know, at my age now as an adult, I don't know a stranger, I'll have a conversation with anyone, but if you were to look at me as a child, I was a complete opposite kid. I was very quiet, I was very shy, not a lot of confidence in myself, um, had some self-esteem issues, um, even depression for that matter. Um, and so, you know, it was, uh, it was interesting. The inspiration, I was, I think I was more searching for that inspiration to come from within and I was realizing that I think it was there somewhere, but it was a difficult thing for me to find because, you know, there were it was it was very difficult for me to really look at myself and say, you can actually succeed and be someone. So when I would find myself in those kind of deeper, darker moments in life, um, I would look towards my teammates and I would look towards athletics because it was an opportunity for me, even though I was a shy person and very quiet, it was an opportunity for me to um, express myself in a manner that I couldn't do elsewhere. And that really drove me, it would drive me to, um, to achieve greatness, if you will, yeah. for my own personal sake, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And did you find that there was, um and we've had a number of speakers talk about their upbringing uh, yesterday um, and how difficult it is as a teen and all the challenges, you know, self-esteem yeah. and um, just really difficult in terms of just navigating through those teen years. Did you find that there was, a, there was a tipping point where things started to come together for you where you thought, you know what, there are opportunities, there, are, there is a different path that I can take. It doesn't all need to be as, um, as difficult. Yeah, so um, I was bullied um, from pretty much elementary school all the way through high school. Um, and, you know, as we know, nowadays, there's a lot more emphasis on, on bullying than there was when, you know, we were in school. Um, and it, it does a number on you. It, it affects you. And, and, and you know, I, I'll, arguably, you can say it affects you for a lifetime. It never necessarily goes away, those memories of being bullied. But it wasn't until... Um, which is also obviously a contributing factor to a, a lack of self-esteem and, and, and such that I mentioned before. So when you, when you experience that, for me personally, there was a threshold um, where it wasn't until I was in high school, um, my senior year in high school, uh, my last year, where um, this one particular student uh, felt the need. Um, he was just constantly a bully. And I finally... There was something inside of me that flipped like a switch almost that just I just said to myself, this is going to be the last time that you say anything like this or do anything like this to me again. And not only that, but I wanted to ensure he was never going to consider do that to anybody else for that matter. And so I stood up to him 
uh, and it turned into a physical altercation, I will admit. Um, and I will also proudly say I won that altercation. But it was that point that gave me the confidence to know that I could overcome something like that level of an obstacle. And that's where I started to realize, you know, there's a lot more to me than I think I realized in terms of what I'm able to accomplish, right? Like, so getting over a bully um, is not a, an easy thing to do. It's a very difficult accomplishment to do. So for me, it was a, it was a personal win to know that I could, and that, and that person never bothered me again after that. And for that matter, from what I understand, no one else for that matter. And Tassos, it's through that storytelling, being able to share not only your experience growing up, but you know, with the kids as well, I, I think that's what it's all about. It's not hiding the kids away from the potential difficulties that may occur. It's actually talking about our own experiences. And um, I know I said earlier that the kids learn more by what we do rather than what we say, but I think that's a, a perfect example there where storytelling just helps build that resilience in the kids around you know, how to handle themselves in what is a very complex world at the moment. Um, some, so if we look at some of those early years for you as well, uh, Tulsus, what were, what were your career aspirations? You know, what, mm. what were you looking at doing into the future? Sure. I can tell you it had nothing to do with baking or a bakery <laughs> for that matter. And also nothing to do with consulting, which I fell into. But I was uh, at a young age, I was obsessed with um, three things. I was obsessed with aviation. I had always uh, aspired to be a pilot. Um, and specifically in the military, I really wanted to go to the U to the United States Navy and fly uh, in the United States Navy as a pilot. Um, the uh, and it, I, it did work out because of my height, and uh, I also wear glasses, so my eyesight at that time uh, didn't qualify me. And corrective surgery at that time was so expensive that it was just not an option, so that was out. Um, I was also uh, very interested in medicine. Um, and, um, my father, um, when first came to the, uh, to the United States, um, they actually immigrated to Ohio, uh, because that's where the sponsorship was from my, for my aunt on my mother's side. And my father worked for Ford on the assembly line, uh, building cars. And so I, my father has a, a big passion and love for, for automobiles of all shapes and sizes and, and year models and what have you. So I also, of course, became obsessed with cars. So there was something about the engineering aspect between aviation and also um, the way that cars work that was very attractive to me. So uh, obviously I didn't do any of that. <laughs> um, uh, so I, 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 but I was, and it's still something that, you know, I still consider every now and again and joke in our house um, that um, that I'm going to go off and get my pilot's license. And of course, you know, my wife has uh, is very good about pointing out my three children in the room and says, <laughs> yeah, that's not happening anytime soon because they need a father and you're not leaving me anytime soon to raise three kids by myself. So I said, all right, that's a fair point. <laughs> So and I always hope that maybe one day I can make enough money to where I can have a collection of cars in a barn somewhere so I can at least tinker with them and, and fulfill that obsession because I don't think anytime soon I'm going to become a medical doctor. There's always flight simulation, Tassos, too. I don't think there's any med you know, <laughs> simulation the in, no, in the medical industry, so don't go simulating anything there. Um, Tassos, so 22 years in consulting and then you, yeah. your career then changed. It took a, quite a dramatic turn. Tell us a little bit about what inspiration did you seek at the time who were your mentors that advised you if you had any of course that advised you to you know what would it, what would it be like to pursue such a different career from consulting yeah so um what's funny is i fell into consulting so a little background i never graduated college so i don't have my undergraduate degree um and so i actually uh left school because i was pursued and was offered a consulting job right as i was still in college because someone saw something in me and gave me an opportunity to make quite a bit of good salary at a very young age of 20, I think I was 21 years old. Um, and, um, and you know, I had a nice conversation with my family and my professors, and they all thought, you really should pursue this because this is more than most people make coming out of college. Um, so I did. And I realized after some years in the profession, I personally did not get any satisfaction out of what I did for a living. And like most people, I want to do something that I have passion and love for. I don't want to feel like going to work is going through the motions. I don't want to feel like work is work. So, um, you know, throughout the years, um, 
the only thing I honestly enjoyed out of two things I really enjoyed out of what I did for, for a living uh, for 22 years was the salary and the, the money was fantastic. I mean, I, who doesn't like to be paid uh, compensated well? Um, and I did enjoy problem solving. Uh, there was something about solving people's problems to an extent with an asterisk, if you will, because some of those problems involved me coming in and realizing the issue is you need to streamline something or, in, you know, implement and integrate some new systems that would also eliminate jobs. And that's something that I didn't enjoy a lot about what I did. And um, so, you know, it was funny in terms of mentors. I didn't have any mentors until I became older and later into my career. And um, I had, there was a good friend of mine that I've known for 20 plus years who actually um, uh, helped recruit me and bring me to Accenture, which Accenture was my recent employer before I, I stopped, uh, I, before I made the leap into commercial baking. Um, and uh, she, you know, along with my wife, believe it or not, uh, was a, a big influence on this, really kind of helped help me understand um, that there's absolutely nothing wrong with uh, taking a risk. And really, Rula was the one to tell me that. Um, and I, I give her a lot of credit because, you know, when you do something for 22 years and you have a family and responsibilities, as every adult does, yeah. the last thing you would ever consider is making an absolute career pivot and giving up a healthy salary with benefits for your family. Um, you know, and be a provider for your home to go take a leap into something that's uncharted waters, right? And you have no idea what to expect. And the only thing you know of that industry is basically what you've read about online, which only gets you so far. And I can tell you that from personal experience. Um, but, you know, she made a great point. And the point to that was, I've never seen you happier um, when you're not, like, you're, you're always happy when you bake bread. I've never seen you this happy. And to be honest, I brought that up. You know, I started baking bread again as an adult for the pure satisfaction of giving me a stress relief. A, it was therapeutic. It was cathartic. Um, I love baking. I mean, I, I love every aspect of it. There's nothing more satisfying to me than being here at the bakery early at 3 a.m. And I've got the entire bakery to myself and a, just me in a deck oven and beautiful breads are going to, you know, you can see the satisfaction of your work, right, as it comes out of the oven, which sounds so simple, but it's so satisfying. And, you know, she looked at me and said, you've never been happier. You've hated your career. You should do something that's happy. And I think because you'll be happier, you'll succeed. And if it fails, you've got 22 years, you can always go back, right? So I went to Accenture, who I'd shipped bread to, by the way, um, my uh, my bosses and whatnot, because uh, we were working remotely, everyone was, it's kind of the model there. And I'd shipped bread to them because they knew that in between Zoom calls and meetings, I was going and shaping dough and retarding dough and baking dough at, at home. And um, I sat down with them and I said, listen, this is something that I have a passion for. This is what I want to do. Um, and they said, we're losing you to bread. And I said, yeah, you're going to lose me to bread. And they said, well, I'll tell you what, we're very proud of you. We think this is a very brave thing for you to do. And we hope to have to not see you again. But if we do, the door's open. Please come back. I, talk, I took that as a sign that we were making the right decision for someone like that um, to give me that type of uh, blessing, if you will, um, was, was something that I took very, it was genuine and it was, uh, and that was great for me. Tassos, you use that word brave and that um, it, it resonates for me on a personal level. When I left a corporate career two and a half years ago to pursue um, my own consulting business, that was the word that people used at the time. And they said, Rita, it's, yeah. a, it's a brave move. And I didn't understand that. I probably understood it 12 months later. Uh, when I understood that in, in doing that, and George and I spoke about this a lot yesterday with a number of our guests, it's about shedding that identity. And there is something very yeah. brave in that, particularly when you've worked so hard all your life to get to a place where you then you're up there and you think the view from up here is not what I thought it would be. Uh, so yeah. your, your story there absolutely resonates. Do you think, you know, um, time on, I guess, from uh, you're well into uh, the bread making, I want to ask you a little bit more about that, but do you still feel that it was brave? Does that word resonate for you now? You know, like you, I didn't realize what that meant until well into it. You know, for me, I had to re pretty pretty much reinvent myself in terms of my identity. I th I'm pretty convinced up to this point, even my family had no idea what I did for a living. They just knew I had a job. 
And I think because I worked remotely so much, I don't think they knew, thought that I even worked um, for that matter. But, you know, I had to, here in Houston, we have a very, very established uh, hospitality industry. We have James Beard winning chefs and nominated chefs and recognized restaurants here. The food scene here in Houston is rated one of the top in the country here in, this, in the States. So I'm very fortunate to work with some of the top chefs in the country that are based here in Houston. But in order for you to quit your corporate career, open a commercial bakery, and then convince a chef who is very difficult to please to buy your product, who he knows you are just some guy baking bread out of a stone pot out of your house in your standard oven at home, all of a sudden you're going to be able to produce the volumes of the quality and consistency that I need as for my restaurant, my guests. You know, that, that takes some convincing. But I, I had to build a credibility, right? I had to build not only a brand, but the ability to show that we were real, right? And this is real. But it was a personal thing for me because it was going to, you know, it, that's when I realized, I can't tell you, I'm sure you've probably done this, but I can't tell you how many times I've woken up in the morning and looked at my wife and go, what have I done? <laughs> What have I done? Absolutely, you do, you do that every day, but it, because it's almost like it's All a risk time. almost every day. You know, you're in you're in your thing, as you say, that the livelihood that you had, that security, you leave that behind to take a risk yeah. every single day. But it's um, it's so exhilarating. There's there's nothing quite like oh, it. So, uh, I love it. Can I tell you something? I've it, younger Tassos would look at you, look at me, and say you're an idiot, right? And now I'm saying, you know, I run the business knowing that we're going to make calculated risks. As long as they, they, the ROI leans more this way than that way, then yeah, we'll, we'll do it because I have, I have belief that it'll work. And now I've never been more confident than I ever have basically in my entire life. So Tassos, I think I must be the 20 millionth person on this, on this planet to have attempted sourdough during COVID. I attempted it <laughs> yes. twice. My family looked at me and thought I was nuts. By the time it got to day three, my sourdough starter wasn't doing much. Any tips sure. that you might send across post this interview, I would really appreciate. I'm going to give sourdough another go. It's not dead for me yet. But what I do want to ask you is those memories that you shared earlier on about baking with your mum, how much of that have you now taken into your current brand? And we have had a question come through. What's your mm -hmm. favorite bread that you bake? <laughs> That's a great question, both of them. Um, so here in, in, in Houston or in the industry, um, our story obviously is very unique. Here's a kid that grew up baking bread with his mother at home, uh, picked it up again, spent 22 years in a career, as you know, and then decided to take the leap. Um, and you know what? It wasn't me just turning the switch and saying, hey, I'm going to quit Accenture and I'm going to go run a bakery. We were we had organic growth from the very beginning. Um, I had uh, chefs and food and beverage directors for hotels and whatnot that were contacting me simply because I was posting pretty pictures of pretty bread on my personal social media accounts. And they thought, hey, that's the guy we want to service us here at a restaurant, hotel, et cetera. So I was getting contacted and that's when I realized maybe we have something here, right? And that's when it was the discussion was to sit down and start. But, you know, our story is so unique that it's ingrained into the brand, right? Because there's a, there's a healthy, lengthy family legacy. My mother knows how to bake because of my grandmother. My yaya taught her how to bake, right? And so forth. So there's, you know, two recipes that we still use, formulas that we still use and breads that my yaya made, right? And we sell here locally. And to me, people, I've, I've learned very quickly, which was something I had to learn how to accept, by the way, kind of going back to your bravery comment or brave comment is people love the story that they want to work with the guy that has taken this risk and has the bravery to do this or the courage to do this. Um, but also because he also makes a great product and, and, and knows how to treat us well as a customer. So, you know, it's great because even down to the name that we came up with, I didn't come up with that name. I can't take credit for it. My six-year-old daughter at the time, who's now nine, will tell you every day that I named daddy's business and it's mine. And I said, you know, maybe one day, honey, it will. <laughs> but she came up with the name and I'm very proud of that because everybody knows that story as well. And it's just, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's great when you have something, that family legacy that ties into your brand. That, to me, there's instant equity in that. 
your story about, so my daughter has laid claim also to um, to one of my businesses and she made exactly the same comment to me. She said, mum, I've come up with it. I picked your colours. Uh, it's mine. So I get that. Yeah. There's that entrepreneurial spirit from when they're six and, and nine and even 10. <laughs> and I don't know how you respond to your daughter, but I tell my daughter, well, you know, that's if daddy still has the bakery by the time you're old enough to run it. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you know? That's right. Tassos, the what, what's really hitting home with me listening to you is that you're not in the business of baking bread. You're right. actually in the business of connecting with the community. Yeah. And, um, and I followed your socials and I can see that connection that you're making with the community. What was the thinking behind that and what's inspired you to project that kind of brand? Because uh, in a really short space of time, you've made some big inroads. And yeah. if you just went out there saying, hey, my name is Tarsos, I'd like to sell you some bread. I don't think people would have been chatting to you. So what is it about the, the brand and um, I, I guess the, the heart of what you're trying to do that's hitting a mark? Yeah, so it's interesting that, you, that, that that question is very interesting because the community to me is super important to not just me personally, but to the business. Um, the community is embraced us from the very beginning. Yeah. And without the community embracing us, we wouldn't have a business, right? So I take it very seriously, no matter how small or large a customer is, because they have choices and they can go elsewhere. We're not the only bakery in town, obviously. There are other competing bakeries here. And I take it very seriously when a, when a, a customer has decided that they select us to entrust us with those needs, because unbeknownst to many, bread is actually a pretty important part of a menu and it can make or break a menu. Um, or an item on that menu. And so, but, you know, not just from a commercial standpoint, but, you know, we also participate in uh, farmers markets and things like that because we like expanding in the outreach to the community because it's, <clears throat> you know, who doesn't love bread? And the community here has been absolutely amazing with, with literally with open arms and bringing us in. Never in my wildest dreams that I think that we would have accomplished what we've accomplished in such a short period of time. The company is only two and a half years old. And we're not even into, you know, year three doesn't come until next July, uh, technically. And it's, you know, we're in four states with Whole Foods in all of Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, and Oklahoma, 48 total stores there alone. Um, and it, that to me is a major accomplishment for someone like Whole Foods to acknowledge that we meet their core values and their standards. But, you know, the, during COVID especially, um, the community you could see obviously all over the world has been impacted, right? People have lost their jobs, they've lost their livelihoods. Uh, some people can't afford um, to provide food even for their families. Um, it really hit home to me when I saw a news story here on one of the local news affiliates in Houston where there was a single mother who had two children and she had lost her job and had no income and also had no savings. And she was crying during this interview and explaining to everyone that she now has to learn how to make bread so she can make sandwiches for her kids. And that really hit home because that's how I know how to make bread because my mom couldn't afford to buy bread. So she made it for us. So when I heard that, I immediately turned to my team and I said, we really need to do something for this person and for every person. And, you know, specifically the hospitality industry here in Houston was obviously severely impacted. And a lot of our customers not only had to lay off employees, but their doors had to shutter, you know, indefinitely. And it was really sad to see that happen because, you know, if you've ever worked in a restaurant, even as a server, you know the amount of work that goes into building that kind of business. It's a lot of work and a lot of passion. And you've got to be a little crazy to do it, let's be honest. Um, but... Um, you know, that same community is the same community that opened their arms and embraced me. And for me, it was time for us to return that favor. So we immediately got into action and we um, started doing pop-ups here locally across Houston and started selling our bread to the community for two reasons. One, we wanted to give them a healthier product that was without artificial ingredients, no artificial preservatives or any of the, some of the ingredients that are unpronounceable, let's say that you find in some of the, you know, uh, products in a store. And also too, you don't have to go wait in an insanely long line to get into the grocery store at that time because of the, I hate to put it this way, but the apocalyptic view that people had with rushing out to the store to buy all the toilet paper in the world, whatever that meant, I'm not sure. But 
you know, I, I thought if we can make it an easier access to people and we'll bring it down to make it affordable in terms of pricing. Um, but at the same time, let's also give bread to those that need it. And so we decided that we were going to donate a loaf of bread um, to uh, any hospitality employee that could come to us and show us that they were unfortunately lost their job or anyone for that matter that was laid off um, and any frontline workers, uh, first responders, mm -hmm. medical workers. Um, I just to me, it felt like it was the right thing to do. And that that news story really hit home for me. Um, and, you know, you do those things because, A, you genuinely care about people. Um, it's people that make our company what it is. It's people that go to the stores every day that purchase it, that constantly send us messages and tell us and compliment the product. And our loyal customers, which I can't tell you, I wish I could send them all a big hug um, and a thank you because it means a lot to me to know that people are going out and purchasing product that we put so much time and effort and passion behind. Um, but, you know, it's obviously it was also good for the business that it recognized that, hey, we're in this with you and we are also being impacted. But we also want to be to know that we haven't forgotten the community that supported us from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's 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 been great. It's been great. The community here is probably uh, I'm probably their biggest fan, whether they know that or not. And Tassos, when you look at um, you spoke about rebranding earlier post corporate for me it was more like an unbranding exercise where you need to completely strip out um, the things that I did in the past that served me really well and focus on uh, new behaviors new rit rituals new skills that need to take me to where I want to be moving forward what did you need to let go of to make sure that you needed to succeed in what you're doing at the moment yeah so there's some things I still need to let go of um, as any entrepreneur, that's the most difficult part um, because it is your baby and you have to now learn to trust uh, and entrust certain parts of your business to other people who are, I'm sure are very well qualified to carry on and execute your vision. But it's still that ability to let that go. So I'm working on that as we speak. But something that I've actually, you know, I've had to learn to make, I mean, every, as you know, as a consultant, which you which I appreciate that both of you um, are consultants and have been in the consulting space for some time. You know that there's opportunity, of course, that comes across your career that you're gonna have to make critical decisions and what those impacts are gonna be. It was very different for me to realize that I'm making a critical decision when in my previous career that doesn't necessarily impact my bottom line, right? And the ability for me to pay employees, right? Who've entrusted me with their livelihoods. Whereas now every decision I make is, is the way I look at it. That's how I make decisions now is how will this impact the business, which in turn will impact the employees, which will in turn will even impact my own household. And so it's, I've had to learn to look at decisions completely differently. And I'm always a type of person that always looks at things forward. So I'm not a, I look at obviously as things that trans, uh, transition now, but you know, when I make a decision, I always think, well, how's this gonna impact us now and, and, and affect us now? But how is this gonna impact us down the road even six months from now or even a year? And so you know, that to me has been something I've had to uh, learn how to do in a different approach to these type of decisions differently. But another thing that I struggle with, George, and I don't know if this is something you've ever experienced is, I have a hard time enjoying the success we've achieved here at Breadman Baking Company because in my mind, I have a lot more work to do. I have a lot more things that I want to achieve. I have goals ahead of me. I have things that I want to, to accomplish, which I haven't really spoken to many about. It's something I kind of sometimes keep close to my chest because they're my own personal wins. Um, but there's so much more ahead of me. And for me, so many people, uh, it even still blows me away. You know, recognition is something I've I've had to struggle with. People coming to me and saying, "Oh, everybody loves you," and I was like, I, "I'm just a guy that bakes bread. I don't know. I mean, it's a, I don't see it that way." But I'm I'm starting to realize <clears throat> I can't do everything. 
Um, I have been fortunate to, to hire good people at the at the company here and um, and put them in their respective roles where they have expertise to help us execute vision and carry on and in leadership roles and whatnot. But there are parts of the business that I still hold on to that I'm learning to now let go because I need to offload that to someone else so that I can focus on continuing to scale and grow the company so that we can hit those marks and my personal milestone win. So it's it's a, you know, I approach it complete, I can approach, I approach, and I say work with quotes because it's not work to me anymore. It's, it's, it's my life. And I approach it completely differently now than I did before. And what, what you said actually does ring true for me as well. And I had a mentor of mine um, as my corporate career was progressing uh, and got into a position of um, seniority. Uh, he said to me, it's time to let go of you as a brand in terms of what you do individually. Yeah. And success for you moving forward is going to be success through others. Uh, yeah. And that was, quite, um, you know, that was quite an important <laughs> turning point for me that I can only take it so far as an individual. But yeah. where you get to that next level is how do you bring a team around you on board and their success is your success. And then from that, um, you know, it develops you as a leader. So I guess the, the next follow-up question to, to that thought, um, Tassos, is... How have you evolved as a leader in the last couple of years? Uh, tremendously. Um, I was always in leadership positions in the past um, with, um, with my previous employers and in my previous career. Um, but this is a completely different approach to leadership for me. Um, I you know, try to teach uh, my leaders here and employees here accountability that um, I, I, sh I, I demonstrate to them that even I am, you know, I am, <laughs> I am infallible. I am not perfect. I will make mistakes. And I have made mistakes along this, this journey. Um, and I've made some bad hires and I've been fortunate to make some good hires and I've made some mistakes. But I will always tell you that um, I will always be the first one to tell you, yeah, that was on me. I made that mistake. And I try to teach that we have, you know, there are there are wins and there's losses and then there's lessons learned most, most importantly. And what does that look like and how do we solution it? And let's not approach a problem as a problem, but let's look at it as an opportunity to improve. Um, and, you know, for us every day, I always say that, you know, just because we're doing it this way doesn't mean it's necessarily the right way. And maybe we need to find out what that right way looks like, but specifically, how does that look like for us here as a company and as a production uh, facility and a commercial bakery? Um, it, it's, excuse me, I have been very fortunate um, to be surrounded by good people here. Um, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't operate, you know, without them. And uh, it's, it's been a great experience. I've really learned a lot about myself as a leader of what I know and what I don't know. <laughs> and, you know, it's a trial by fire when you're an entrepreneur and you've, you know, risked it all, let's say, and you're throwing everything into it. Um, and now you've hired a team and we have 17 employees and they all look at you because you're the boss and everything stops with you. You know, that's, that's a lot of pressure, right? And you want to perform, you know, as a leader to them and demonstrate that you know what you're doing, even though when you don't know what you're doing, because that will happen and it has happened. Um, and, you know, it's and sometimes when I don't know, I throw it out to the team. I get them involved. I want them to. I want them to succeed. I'm a big proponent of hiring from, or excuse me, promoting from within. Um, I would prefer to have someone that would come in in an entry level position and grow because they were coached, uh, because we had the ability to show them uh, exactly um, what it would take to 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 find a career path within the company, depending on their interest. I genuinely care what our employees are interested in because that will carve off, uh, carve out a career path, you know, here in the company. And let's sit down and look at what is this gonna take for you to get from point A to point B and eventually to point C. Um, so, you know, for me, that's super important. Keeping culture is also a part of leadership, you know, establishing a solid culture within your company. Uh, a, toxic, a toxic culture is will kill you um, way faster than anything else will. Um, and so we work very hard at that. I personally work very hard at that. I have to remind myself that y you're, you're the owner. 
<laughs> right? And so there's a level of culture here that you build, but you also still have to separate yourself in a way in that leadership role so that it doesn't become too lax, if you will, in your culture. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And it does. It's it, you know, we, we've heard it um, enough times, but it still rings true. And that is that culture starts from the top. And, and when you are the yeah. owner, I think there's, um, as you say, you, you don't have that larger backing of a, of a corporate, even if you are a leader in a corporate, it's you, it's your culture, it's your yeah. values that come through. And I think that that's, um, it makes it all the more special. Tassos, yeah. we've got a, a couple of um, questions that have come through uh, on the socials. So one person, um, actually, Christina from Houston, is asking oh. whether you plan to teach any baking classes. She said she would love to have an outlet to learn outside of the internet. Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, yes, we eventually have intention uh, to provide a baking class of sorts. Um, we are in a time of year now where it's absolutely bananas because it's Thanksgiving and, you know, this is the busiest time of year for bakeries. Um, we're also in a time frame of uh, where we're planning expansion, which we can touch on here in a minute if you'd like. Um, but yes, we do have every intention of doing that. In fact, I, you know, my consulting career is, was focused on learning and development. And so, uh, you know, I am very capable of putting together a class uh, and conducting it. Um, so yes, uh, in the near future, and if they want to continue to follow us on our social media, um, on Instagram is really where we have a big presence on, uh, and it's at Breadman Co on Instagram. And, you know, that's usually where we put a lot of our updates and what we got coming up. But yes, I'd be happy to teach someone um, how to bake sourdough. We do get a lot of requests of people calling us constantly saying, hey, can I, can I have some of your starter? I say, no, you can't. <laughs> but I'm sure you'd make <laughs> an exception mine. to send it to Melbourne, of course, for me with my two, two attempts. Um, Absolutely. Tell, tell us all about your expansion plan. So you, you obviously mentioned that just in the last response, but tell us more about that. Any, any plans to expand globally? And I'm thinking uh, Melbourne. Well, I know you've got a connection to Sydney and in particular Manly, <laughs> but I'm thinking Melbourne. Yeah, like my first cousin now lives in Manly Beach, and now I have family in Melbourne, obviously. Um, you know, obviously, look, from your lips to God's ears, if I'm able to expand globally, I would happily accept that. Um, you know, we are, so this is our second facility, if you will, from when we started. When I first started baking out of our house, I moved into this small commercial kitchen. And the small commercial kitchen was one of those situations or scenarios where you can you have multiple smaller vendors that could operate under the same umbrella with permitting and whatnot from the city so that you can work in a commercial kitchen. But it was shared space. So it was kind of difficult work. And um, we grew out of that pretty quick. In about six months' time, it was time to we needed to move on. So once we did that, we built this space that I'm currently sitting in now, which is just a 5,000-square-foot bakery. And most people, when they hear they go, wow, that's a big space. And I'm like, no, it's actually very tiny. Um, we've actually outgrew that about seven months ago. So we are actually in the process of expanding. We have... Um, we have secured a, a new facility that is significantly larger than what we're in now. Um, we have uh, quite a bit of uh, opportunities coming in our pipeline. And some, most of them have committed um, going into next year. So it's going to take us to expand and scale in order for us to accommodate this demand. Uh, significantly higher volumes than what we're producing now. Uh, so we're in, in uh, scale mode, right? So we're expanding, we're scaling, we're about to invest a, a bunch of money into a new facility, which is very exciting. Because just in 2017, I was baking bread out of Dutch ovens in my home, you know, trying to perfect the perfect loaf, which is something I'm obsessed with. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's super exciting. Um, we we've done a lot of uh, work behind it. Um, there's a lot of effort. In fact, that's it's completely consuming me now because it's really only only thing I'm focusing on is our expansion. Um, and it's just exciting. I mean, I, I tell people constantly, like, someone pinch me. Like, this isn't real. Mm -hmm. um, I would have never in my, you know, right mind growing up ever thought that I'd be in a position that I'm in now. And, I'm, and I tell people constantly, I'm just very happy to be here. Awesome story, Tassos. Absolutely awesome story. I have, sorry, just one more from the social media. It's right. It's a ruler from Houston. And ruler has asked if you can please share the kitchen counter story when you were apparently <laughs> setting up the kitchen and it involves Papa Love, also known as Mr. Christie. Yes. Yeah. So how this whole thing started, uh, that's a great, and the ruler from Houston is my wife. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Yes, that's, a, that's actually a, a story that I didn't get a chance to mention before. So uh, my father-in-law, who I love dearly, um, passed away in 2013, unfortunately. And um, he, every Easter, which is a big holiday for the Greek community, um, would make uh, his beautiful, homemade, very uh, ornately decorated breads like they make in the villages and back in Greece. And he would gift everybody in the family, every every household in the family got one of these breads. And Rule and I happened to be standing in the corner of our kitchen at the island, as she described. Um, and she had, um, we were on a conversation about, it was around Easter time. And we'd had a conversation and she mentions that, you know, we really haven't had really good bread since my dad passed away. I really miss my dad. I really miss his bread. And it was that point that it sparked the memory that you know how to make bread. And so I raised my hand and I said, you know, honey, I, I actually know how to make bread. And she stopped for a second and gave me this look and said, you mean to tell me? And then that time we had been married eight years. And she goes, you mean to tell me we've been married eight years and I don't know this about you? I was like, yeah, that's accurate. And she says, all right, make me bread. So I started uh, baking and then I realized how much I loved it again. And it really sparked the memory of baking with my mom. Um, so, you know, honestly, I really, and Rule and I totally uh, believe in this, that that conversation, um, you you can you can't argue that it, or you can argue that it was my father-in-law shining light on this. Um, I, I think he knew that I always wanted to find my thing, whatever that was. And honestly, up until this point, I didn't know what that was. And for the first time, I feel like I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to do, uh, not just career-wise, but in life. And I've never been more satisfied in what I do every day. And I really honestly believe uh, Papa Love or my father-in-law, Papa Jimmy, as we called him, um, was was shining light and kind of steering me in this direction. And, um, you know, I'm forever grateful for that. And I always when we visit him at the cemetery, I always thank him um, for that push, if you will. Mm, that's a beautiful tribute. One more little comment from Ruler, and she says she promises to pick up her dental floss if you promise to pick up your socks. It's the last comment that's come through from Ruler. <laughs> Yeah, sock <laughs> balls. Yeah, I ball my socks up and throw them on the floor. And then I do that on purpose now because I know that anger is her, but that's fine. She'll get over it eventually. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Okay, so we finish um, all of our interviews, Tassos, with two customary questions. The first one is, if you were on a video call with your 18-year-old self, what advice would Oof. you give? Um, have faith in yourself. Uh, believe in yourself. Um, life is going to be hard. Um, but you absolutely can do anything that you put your mind to. And it was something that I struggled with at 18. At 18, I was um, not, I don't publicly talk about this, but I guess now we're going to publicly talk about this. Um, I was, I was uh, in my teenage years, specifically in my early, early 20s, um, actually, I guess most of my 20s. Um, and even now I, I battle with it, but I, I was pretty severely depressed, um, very bad. Um, and it was probably some of my darkest days. And I literally didn't think that uh, not only was I not worth the life I had, but I didn't think that I was worth uh, really anything, that I couldn't accomplish anything, um, that I wasn't going to be successful, um, that I was going to be a constant failure. And, you know, that you put a lot of pressure on yourself when you do that as well, right? Because you're just constantly beating yourself down. And after a while, you just get exhausted from that. Um, so I would, I would look back and tell myself, you know, there are big things coming for you. And you just don't know them yet, but just believe that you have the ability to do whatever it is you decide that it is that's going to make you happy, that's going to translate into success. And I would have never thought at that age um, that I'd be here having this conversation with you guys. Awesome. Follow your dreams is what I'm hearing there. Now, yeah. the last thing that we play with our, with our guests, our impactologists, which you've now become okay. one of, is word association. So I'm going to say a word, and if you could just repeat <laughs> back the first word that comes into your mind. You ready to play? Sure. Sure. Okay, family. Love. Inspiration. Bread. Dallas. Home. Greece. Home. Love. Rula. Community. Houston. Heritage. Greek. And the future. It's very bright. Tassos, 
thank you so much for joining us today. Big plug for Breadman Baking Company. If we were there, I, I wish I could only see it on Instagram and it looks beautiful. So uh, congratulations on setting up such thank a wonderful you. brand and, and on the success and may it yeah. be you know long, long lived. So congratulations again and thank you for joining us. Tassos, I just want to just say in closing, thank you so much. Um, I've really enjoyed listening to your story and I think you and I need to connect for more reasons than one, but in particular about uh, vintage cars. So uh, look out for my DM and look forward to catching up with you. Thank you Absolutely. so much. Thank you guys so much for having me. This has been an absolute pleasure and it was an honor to be a part of it. Thank you guys again. I appreciate it. And George, we will definitely connect. Thank you. Thanks, Tassos. Have a great day. Thanks, guys. You too. Joining us in seven minutes on Impactology Live is Natalie Kogan, also joining us from the US. So stay tuned. We will see you in seven minutes.